Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Wilcox. I am the Associate Director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, and we are excited to have Dr. Sarah Lowe with us today. She's going to be presenting Insights for Rural Healthcare Resilience, a Quantitative Survey Analysis. And it's a bit awkward, my um, introducing Sarah, she and I are friends from a long time ago. We went to graduate school together uh, at Purdue and it's such a pleasure to have her um, come and speak with us today. Um, I did wanna introduce her somewhat formally and then Sarah can fill in the blanks. Um, but uh, as of September, 2018, uh, Sarah has served as an associate professor of regional economics and has held the Fred V. Hunkel uh, Chair in Agriculture within the Division of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Missouri. And excitingly, she just recently became, I believe the uh, title is Director of the Center for Ag and Rural Finance Policy Research um, at the University of Missouri. So we're really excited about that uh, addition to the FAPRI family there at Mizzou. And we're really looking forward to all the great work that's going to come out of that new center. And so with that, you probably all know Sarah is an expert in entrepreneurship and, and rural development and followed her career for years from ERS up to the present day. Um, but today she's going to speak to us about um, some healthcare resilience work that she's doing. So I'll go ahead and mute and Sarah, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. And I will... Um... There we go. Hopefully everyone sees the title slide now. Thanks again for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a research project today that looks specifically at factors associated with rural health care provider retention. OK, this is an important topic that um, for several reasons we're experiencing a, a decline in health care providers in rural areas. And most of this research was conducted before COVID, right? COVID has just made it worse. We're now also dealing with COVID burnout in healthcare providers. Um, despite the declines in healthcare provision in rural areas, healthcare is a really important part of the rural economy. Um, it's necessary to attract and retain residents to rural areas. People want to have access to quality healthcare. And the healthcare sector is one of the largest employers in rural communities, quite frankly. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about our research that expands existing literature. There's quite a bit of literature out there that looks at community assets. What is it about our community? Um, what are some assets? What are our wealths? What are our, our pluses, our minuses? And how do those relate to healthcare provider retention? Um, most of the existing literature is anecdotal, uses case studies or small samples. So the research I'm presenting today is really uh, unique because we have a large sample of rural healthcare providers. We're using an ERS survey. And um, this survey was conducted in 2015, but has never been analyzed or used uh, until now. So we're using this unique set of data and combining it with the rural wealth creation framework to look at the impacts of community capitals on provider propensity to um, consider leaving a community. So let me first start with my awesome co-authors. This work is was driven really by Maria Coons. Uh, that's Maria in the top right there. She's unable to be with us today. She's now working for MU Extension as part of our Small Business Development Center as an entrepreneurship specialist. And Maria was my graduate student. She was a master's student here at MU working with me, working with the Exceed team on Rural Economic Development Extension. She graduated in May. And the work that I'm presenting today was her, essentially her, her master's thesis. The work kind of grew out of some work that I did when I was at ERS with John Pender, who's also co-author on this paper. That's John's picture um, below there. And John and I were both at ERS in the rural economy branch when we put together this survey. So this is the 2015 ERS survey on rural community wealth and healthcare provision. Today's research question is gonna really focus on external factors like community wealth, community assets, and how they can affect healthcare provider retention. In a nutshell, the findings kind of suggest that if the job is good, okay, uh, the pay has to be good, the hours have to be reasonable, 
Um, providers want to feel like they're making a difference, doing a good thing. If the job is good, then these community factors, these community assets really can affect um, retention. And so I'll close uh, because I love everything to do with policy. I'll close with policy implications for what we're kind of calling healthcare entrepreneurship and uh, community leaders. All right, a little bit more background than I already gave you. Um, essentially, we have fewer hospitals in rural America. We have a shortage of providers. Uh, we have the healthcare sector being extremely important to rural economy, uh, the rural economy. Actually, in Missouri, um, post COVID, healthcare is the largest employer in non metro counties in Missouri, larger even than government, which includes K through 12 teachers. So, this is the first time I think ever healthcare has been um, larger than, um, than government in rural Missouri. So, it's pr pretty, pretty darn amazing. Um, to address this issue of, of why providers want to choose to practice in urban areas instead of rural areas, um, there have been quite a few other studies that look at community assets and built capital like schools, like housing, like natural amenities, and they have found these things have positive um, impacts on provider retention and also helping providers establish social capital in their workplace. Um, so this research is really going to look at a, um, a larger pool of people across three different regions in the US, um, and we're going to better dive into these community capitals and the provider retention question. So just a little bit more on, on motivation. Here's a map of counties in the US that contain a primary care health professional shortage area. I'm here in Missouri. You really see Missouri pops out in this map. Um, uh, Mississippi is popping out at me in this map too. So there certainly are regional disparities in the, in the availability or the shortage of primary care um, providers. Okay, um, and and this chart on the right is is just for Missouri. It's not for the whole U.S., but it just kind of shows the the physicians per capita in metro and non-metro areas of the state. So we're really seeing a lot fewer. Uh, primary care physicians in rural areas. This is probably correlated with the fact that rural areas tend to have lower health outcomes, um, partly due to age, um, and often um, health poor health behaviors, right? We see more obesity, tobacco use, uh, sometimes more suicide and disability in, um, in, in rural communities. Um, of course, we also have kind of a Medicaid expansion problem, right? Missouri has been one of these states that has, has not embraced Medicare, Medicaid expansion until just now. So that, that certainly hurt rural, um, rural hospitals. And that may be partly why we see Missouri, you know, kind of popping in this map. Let me switch now to talk a little bit more about the actual survey that we're using for this analysis. Okay. So as I mentioned, the survey was put together by ERS economists and conducted in collaboration with Iowa State University and Washington State um, uh, around 2015. And uh, there just really was a shortage of people at ERS, so we didn't quite get around to analyzing the survey. And when Maria came to work with me for graduate school, I, um, she was very interested in entrepreneurship and healthcare. And I mentioned this survey and we managed to make it work. Um, essentially, she went to ERS and did a summer internship where she could um, access the survey on the ERS network. And um, then she and I both remained visiting scholars with ERS um, and used the confidential data um, for this analysis from, from Missouri. So, so kind of a cool story with this survey. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about the survey. The survey um, covers nine different states in three regions. So this map kind of shows um, we have the upper Midwest, the lower Mississippi Delta, and the southern Great Plains regions. And the survey targeted towns. So initially, 150 rural towns were randomly selected uh, through these nine states. These are all towns with less than 20,000 people, OK? So at least 2,500. Um, but less than, than 20,000. About half had a hospital, half didn't. Um, turned out only 133 of those towns had healthcare providers. So those are the towns that we focus on. And there were two parts to the survey. 
There were key informant interviews with local economic development leaders, um, mayors, chambers of commerce, those sorts of things, and also healthcare administrators, so hospital administrators. The second part of the project was the healthcare provider survey itself. And that's the part that we're going to use for our analysis, but I do want to provide a little bit of background context about these key informant interviews um, that should be helpful. All right. So again, key informant interviews, we're talking to town leaders and economic development, healthcare administrators. Um, this, the, the key informant interviews asked a lot about positives and negatives of a community. Uh, so this particular chart are the positive characteristics from the perspective of people living there, but not healthcare providers. Okay. So uh, I'm going to mouse over this. Uh, we see good schools right up there. Okay. Uh, people are very proud about their schools. They think they have great schools. Um, of course, in migrants from other areas may not think the schools are quite up to their standards, right? But, but uh, in rural communities, people are generally very proud of their schools, right? Um, additionally, they highlighted the small town feel or the rurality. Again, people living in rural communities think this is a great thing. In migrants, doctors from urban areas maybe don't think that's the greatest thing. Um, outdoor recreation and amenities also ranked pretty high. And that was defined here as kind of lakes, mountains, trails for hiking, um, those sorts of things. So that was kind of what the economic development leaders saw as, as assets or positive characteristics of the town. Um, again, to kind of put all these key informant interviews in a nutshell, uh, generally they suggested that community leaders could and should have a role in healthcare provider attraction and retention. And uh, if you want to know more about that, you'll be pleased to know that John Pender and Maria and several others are working on an ERS report that summarizes um, all of the, the survey and the key informant interviews uh, into a really nice report. So that report is uh, coming down the line. You know, I can't promise when it will be there, but lots more detail um, is going to be available on that really soon. Okay. Now I'm gonna to switch to the healthcare provider survey. And that's the survey we're gonna use in the analysis I wanna talk about today. So, so pivoting to the healthcare provider survey, um, we, we basically randomly selected 32 healthcare providers in each town. So, and they were mailed a survey. So this is not a, a, a telephone interview like the key informants, it's a, it's a mail survey. Uh, 63.5% response rate, so pretty pretty decent response rate. There was a pilot, um, there was a $40 incentive that went out to everyone, whether they did it or not. Um, so there was a little bit of a, of a push to get that good, uh, good response rate. You'll see here the response rate did vary a little bit regionally. So the upper Midwest um, had, a, had, a, had the highest response rate, the lower Mississippi Delta had, had the lower response rate. And here we have characterized the types of healthcare providers. We had dentists, physicians, MDs, uh, DOs, and then our advanced care practitioners, um, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and midwives. So that's just a little bit of a, of a breakdown. And, and I can send you guys more um, details if, if you're wanting these detailed numbers. I know those numbers are tiny on your screen. So I wanted to go over just some high level findings from the provider survey. Really the importance of family and familiarity with the community was very important. And to those of us who've done research in rural communities, they won't be surprised by this at all, right? If you're doing work on migration, if you're doing work on attraction of businesses, um, family or ties to the community is always kind of a, you know, a top reason. Okay. So we see proximity to family and friends, but then after that, you know, attributes of the job, the job, the job is important. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's great if you can be close to family ties, but the, but the job really, you know, is, is important. The biggest drawback Okay, so this is the healthcare providers. The biggest drawback to the rural community where they're located in, lack of amenities. And this definition of amenities is talking about coffee shops, restaurants, um, 
cultural events, more urban amenities, um, the kind of things that improve quality of life. So that was kind of the, the biggest drawback that was um, influenced. And it's also a drawback that is policy relevant. If you're working with economic development practitioners, uh, this is something you can you know, do. You cannot change the distance <laughs> to their family or their home. Uh, you cannot change uh, generally the lack of population. Um, but urban amenities is a, a nice policy relevant um, sort of sort of thing. Okay, um, the most important factor for recruiting or retaining, again, the job, right? So this financial package is essentially the financial package for the for the healthcare provider's job. Okay, that was really really important, as you might imagine, and then work life balance and their colleagues. You know, the the job. The job matters, and then after that, you know, a good place to raise a family or, or um, the culture of the organization, the culture of the community, um, that matters. Basically, if the job is good, then the community assets such as colleagues, amenities, and culture matter. Um, then uh, this one is just kind of summarizing how important the, each of these are for continuing to work in the community. So again, we're serving providers that are located in small rural communities. And again, you know, the friendliness of the, of the place, the culture, um, having impact. People want to work where they have an impact, where they can make lives better. And so we see that here, that uh, the, the job has to be good. The job has to be impactful, okay? Quality of schools is down here, um, size of the town. Again, a, a lot of different factors. And a lot of these are kind of interrelated factors. So again, there's a, a big survey with lots of questions. And again, the ERS report that's in the works will summarize um, all of those findings. It's gonna be a big report. Um, but but the, generally the takeaway was that the provider survey um, suggested Many were in rural areas due to ties to the region. And those that didn't have some kind of tie to the region, like family, may want to leave to be closer to family. Okay. So this kind of suggests that communities that can welcome newcomers and help newcomers create a supportive network are, are going to have a better chance of being able to retain healthcare providers. And I would argue a lot of other professionals. Um, amenities such as restaurants, coffee shops, cultural events were, were big factors. Um, and again, we saw with the provider survey, the job has to be good for the community factors to matter. Okay. All right. So now I'm kind of pivoting into the empirical analysis. I'm an economist. I'm going to be as uh, minimally mathy uh, as possible and kind of keep this on a, an extension, an accessible extension level. And like I said, I'd love to have discussion with you at the end on, on kind of the results and the policy implications. But for now, we'll dive into um, a little bit of econometrics. <laughs> okay, so uh, the research questions, just to recap, how, how do community assets affect the retention of rural health care providers? And are there policy relevant things that communities can invest in that would help retain providers, okay? Like a coffee shop. You might not think of a coffee shop as policy relevant, but it might be something that is something a community should think about investing in, right? Uh, so here's where I get kind of technical method. We're gonna use a probit regression. Um, we've got the individual survey data and survey weights. We've merged those with county level data. One caveat with the county level data is because we have these 132 towns, we only have I think 113 different counties. So there's not as much variation in the county level data as if the provider survey were a random sample, of course, across the whole US, okay? So our dependent variable is going to come from the survey. It's going to be a, a binary variable, so a, a yes or a no, a one or a zero, for whether the provider respondent indicated that they've considered leaving the community. So 42% of the healthcare providers that responded to the survey said, yes, I have considered leaving this community. This is not an ideal dependent variable. 
Okay. Um, you could probably poke a lot of different holes in it, but it's what we have. That's often the case with these surveys. Um, you know, ideally it would be great to have some longitudinal data and to be able to follow people and, and ask questions of the providers that did actually leave the community. And of course, the providers that have already left the community before they even got the survey, right? They're not in this pool. So, so it's, it's not a perfect um, dependent variable, um, but the fact that it works suggests that if we had the perfect variable, these results, I think, might be even stronger. Okay, so just keep that in mind. The, the outcome variable is whether a provider has considered leaving the small town where they're currently practicing. Okay, so that's our dependent variable. And our explanatory variables, we're going to have a suite of provider characteristics from the survey. We're going to have a, um, a list of factors that are important to continuing to work in the, in the community. Um, some of those questions I just showed um, would give you an idea on that. And then we're merging in again, um, county level control variables, but also what we call rural wealth creation variables. Um, so who's familiar with the rural wealth creation framework? Nobody really has their camera on, so I can't see anyone raise their hand, but that's okay. Okay, uh, you can give me a thumbs up. Okay, good, Shelly's clapping, giving me a thumbs up. Okay, so some of you in rural development might be familiar with this. Uh, the Flores kind of had the idea first and, and they've, they've got the lead in the sociology. Uh, the, the ag economists had to have their own thing. So uh, here I have um, John Pender et al's Rural Wealth Creation book. Um, both of these books kind of talk about rural wealth creation as being more holistic, maybe, than just financial wealth. Uh, it's talking about culture, social capital, political capital, um, natural capital, you know, amenities, um, human capital, education. Um, so it's a more holistic approach to, to rural wealth. So John had kind of led this work on rural wealth creation before this survey, was um, was conducted. And so one of the impetuses for the survey, again, John Pender led this survey, was to kind of look at how this rural wealth creation framework um, measured up, how, how useful it was for looking at healthcare provision. So we had a few hypotheses, again, a little bit, you know, scientific here, but I'm trying to trying to keep it um, at an even playing field with everyone. Okay, so we had a hypothesis about workplace characteristics and satisfaction with work-life balance. Um, and again, keep in mind, we did this, we started this before COVID. I think that this hypothesis is way more salient now. Um, but essentially, we, we recognize that workplace characteristics and satisfaction with work-life balance, um, those were all going to affect, uh, we hypothesize, a provider's likelihood of considering relocating. OK, we also had a hypothesis around social capital, you know, uh, that had been identified in some of the prior literature and the case study work um, and kind of saying that social capital should um, uh, increase a provider's um, desire to maybe stay in a community if, if they feel like they have good social capital. And then as, as Michael alluded to in my introduction, I, you know, I've been really interested in entrepreneurship as a rural economic development strategy for a long time since I started at the Kansas City Fed shortly after I graduated from Purdue. So it's not Sarah Lowe if there's not an entrepreneurship hook. So we had an entrepreneurship uh, hypothesis. Uh, I'm for entrepreneurship. So we, Maria and I were both very interested in whether providers who kind of had their own practice or engaged in entrepreneurship were less likely to consider relocating. Um, and this hypothesis was very personal for Maria. Um, I mentioned she came to me wanting to kind of interested in healthcare and entrepreneurship. Interesting combination you ask. Well, Maria's story is that her mother is an advanced care um, nurse practitioner in a rural area in Illinois, and her mother started her own practice and practices independently and focuses her practice on bringing um, care to people in their home, particularly uh, the elderly that might not be able to get to the doctor for regular visits for chronic conditions. Um, so that's that was kind of Maria's, Maria had this very neat background in what we're calling health entrepreneurship um, that kind of motivated our hypothesis about entrepreneurship. 
Great. Okay. So uh, there were a million variables. For those of you who have dabbled in kind metrics, you'll recognize that a million variables are problematic. Um, so I'll get to that. But I want you to know we controlled for provider demographics and, and workplace characteristics. Okay. We had a whole suite of, of control variables from the provider survey. And then we also had these this suite of questions on the survey, important factors for retention, okay? So that was kind of another vector of variables that we had. And then of course we had our county level um, controls uh, or town level here um, that, that I think are important, just covariates to control for. And then we had our rural wealth creation variables. These are variables that were um, essentially put together in an ERS report that John Pender and others published um, about 10 years ago. We've got Anil Ripasinga and Stefan Getz's social capital index, which tends to work well. Um, here's human capital, percent of the population with a bachelor's degree or higher, kind of the idea that um, communities with more educated people might be more likely to attract and retain healthcare providers. We're very interested in K through 12 education, okay? That seemed to be a, a, a big thing. So school district expenditures, um, innovation, uh, financial capital availability for nascent entrepreneurs, um, access to, to highways, um, broadband internet um, adoption rates. So we were trying to control for these types of, of rural wealth, um, different assets that rural communities could invest in. And, and not only control for these, but also kind of say, well, are they relevant? You know, which, you know, which of these rural wealth um, variables are, are relevant, are, are good investments for communities that are looking to attract and retain um, healthcare providers, but also other professionals and other businesses. Okay, Whew. we made it through the econometrics. There'll be no Greek if you want, uh, if you want the equations and stuff, you can, email me and I'll send them along. Let me summarize kind of what we did and, um, and jump to the fun stuff, the conclusions and the policy implications. Okay, so we started out with a model with just our, our individual level variables, okay? And then we added in these factor variables and then we added in the whole enchilada and we ended up with a 10 billion different explanatory variables and some multicollinearity. Okay, so then we did um, our fourth model that I'm presenting the results for here uh, is a walled restricted model. So we're bas basically using a walled restricted um, model to eliminate the jointly insignificant variables from the regression. Okay, and so that reduced, uh, eliminated essentially our multicollinearity problems. Um, interestingly, almost all of the county level rural wealth creation asset variables were eliminated, i.e. they were um, jointly insignificant, okay? So they were jointly insignificant in explaining the variation in pro provider propensity to leave. So that was a little bit disappointing. We only had two of those variables that survived this walled test. And um, basically the human capital, how many people have a college education, and this is one of the variables that's part of David McGranahan's natural amenity index, um, percent uh, of water area. So are there lakes, are there shores, or is there, it's kind of a recreation or natural amenity variable. Those were the only two variables that survived our, our walled restricted model. The other variables that survived were um, from the survey. So it wouldn't be an econometrics paper without endogeneity. So, Close your ears if you're not an econometrician. Um, I think endogeneity is going to be the death of, um, of rural development and regional economics. Um, everyone who's worked with me knows that I think when you're working in regional and rural, everything affects everything. <laughs> so, but we had feedback from some people as we took this paper out to, on the conference circuit that there could be um, endogeneity because one survey question regressed on another survey question could create endogeneity. I don't think so, but the endogeneity police have a really loud alarm. So we used um, Lubel's 2012 approach um, essentially to um, 
instruments, uh, since we didn't have any um, good instruments available, we use the, his approach essentially uses the heteroscedasticity in the first stage regression as an instrument to predict the endogenous explanatory variables, okay? Um, when we did the, the Lubel, unfortunately, um, it was under-identified, okay? So we can't reject the null. Um, but here on this slide, I basically have our, our best model and this Lubo model that kind of corrects for the endogeneity. But the Lubo model is no good because it's under-identified, da 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 um, But the good news here is the results between um, the regular probit and the Lubo probit that account for the endogeneity are very similar. So this su suggests to me that the endogeneity is really not a big deal. Okay. Um, so I highlighted some of the variables, but I'm going to come back to some of these variables um, in discussion of the results. Um, but we can flip back to this. It's very small. I know you guys can't see it hardly. We can come back to this in the discussion if anyone wants to talk about some of those point estimates in detail. All right. So we had these three hypotheses. What did we find? Well, I already kind of alluded to the fact that we didn't find a lot in the rural wealth creation variables. Um, they frankly didn't explain a lot of the propensity to want to leave. The, the one rural wealth creation variable that, um, that we're gonna argue um, made a difference um, is, is essentially the social capital. And so I want to share a few point estimates. Um, all of those slides I just showed uh, are marginal effects for those of you who are economists out there. So I'm going to talk about some of those marginal effects uh, in terms of the point estimates. Okay. Being from a rural area. So if a provider is from a rural area, it decreased their likelihood to consider leaving by about 4%. So not huge, but not nothing either. Okay. Um, so being from a rural area made a big difference. Another really interesting variable that mattered was volunteerism, okay? Working in the communities, a provider that volunteered um, outside of their medical practice in the community was less likely to leave by 10%. And that was a really striking variable to us, but it, it spoke to this social capital. The provider is tied into the community. A lot of these healthcare providers, they wanna make a difference. They're working in a rural community because they feel like they're needed in a rural community. And so even though this volunteering variable was something outside of healthcare, we see that they want to give, they want to be connected to the community, they wanna make their community better. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. As I alluded to earlier in the descriptive statistics, the work, the work, the job essentially is really important also, okay? Uh, particularly work-life balance. So increasing the weekly hours from a little bit more than full-time, a little bit more than 40 hours a week to a little bit more than 50 hours a week increased a provider's likelihood to consider leaving by over 20%. So that is, is very interesting. And, and a lot of us are kind of burned out after COVID, right? So we're maybe not surprised by this. You know, maybe this, maybe this is true for academics, you know, or extension professionals, um, in addition to healthcare providers, but, um, having a, a you know, a reasonable amount of work, this, uh, on-call responsibilities are, are closely related. So in a rural community, you can imagine the on-call responsibilities may be a little bit higher because there are fewer providers to spread those on-call responsibilities across, okay? So having unacceptable on-call responsibilities had a similar kind of magnitude of effect, okay? So if you're, if you're, if you're overworked or um, if you're feeling like you're on-call too much, you're having to leave your kid's event for an on-call, your weekend is pepper, you can't go out of town because you know, your pager might go off. Um, this kind of work-life balance, those are, those are huge effects. Um, and so if we're thinking about, you know, 16 or 20% more likely to consider leaving, um, that's a really big deal. Um, also, the provider's likelihood to consider leaving increased with additional children. Um, this was a result that we thought was kind of interesting particularly because the community leaders thought, you know, the K through 12 schools were important and the rurality is important and people want to raise their children in rural areas. 
Um, but we actually kind of saw a small but statistically significant effect uh, when, when one has more children, they're maybe more likely to leave. Um, so we're not sure why, but we, we, have, we may, you know, maybe schools are, are part of that equation or the cultural opportunities that we talked about, right? The opportunities for travel team or to do theater or those sorts of things, um, maybe make a, a more urban area or suburban area um, look more attractive. Okay, our third hypothesis, this entrepreneurship piece. So we found that owning all or part of a practice, like Maria's mom, right? She is sole proprietor, uh, nurse practitioner, providing um, primary care to elderly people in rural Illinois. So people like Maria's mom, uh, their likelihood of considering leaving um, was decreased by 12%. Again, that's a pretty large effect. Um, what's not on here are a lot of the other smaller effects. Okay, there were a lot of other smaller effects um, that I could show you in those tables. But these were the, the results related to our hypotheses. And they're also some of the kind of results that had more economically significant magnitudes. And I think, you know, I think several of these results have real policy implications for those of us in extension or community leaders who are thinking about what can we do to help our healthcare providers, particularly in this time of crisis with COVID, what can we do to uh, in, it, get them to stay in our community? So moving on then to the, the policy implications, um, again, we're just economists, so I'll take this with a grain of salt, but <laughs> uh, on the entrepreneurship, you know, um, Helping healthcare providers think about a startup or financing a startup, or you know, maybe SBDC can think about helping people with startup. I know that's part of the reason Maria decided to join SBDC after finishing her master's degree. Okay. Um, we are working with um, Kathleen Quinn, who's the associate dean in our uh, Mizzou School of Medicine um, on this research. And we asked her and she said, you know, the big barrier to health entrepreneurship, as we're calling it, is the malpractice insurance, right? That's the big barrier. So are there policy prescriptions for making malpractice insurance um, more affordable for people who want to practice in these healthcare shortage provider areas or in rural areas? Okay, that's a, that's a potential um, policy prescription. Maybe a community can help offset that malpractice insurance cost to entice a, a provider to stay in their community, to become an entrepreneur in their community. Um, you know, Missouri in the COVID era increased the distance um, between advanced practice practitioners and the MD that supervises them. So Missouri is one of 11 states that does not allow um, nurse practitioners, for example, to practice independently. So there's a policy implication right there. Okay. Um, but what Missouri did during COVID is they um, doubled the distance uh, between the MD and the, and the nurse practitioner uh, in an effort to increase, um, increase um, provision. Okay. So that's something that can be done at the state level, increasing the distance. And another thing, again, at the state level, depends on what state you're in, but again, here in Missouri, we could also perhaps just allow nurse practitioners to practice independently, period, okay? Uh, encouraging that entrepreneurship. I think also on the entrepreneurship, uh, all the usual things that we talk about with rural entrepreneurship would apply to these healthcare providers. You know, it's particularly if we can, get over the kind of the malpractice insurance piece, right? So um, there has to be good workforce, available workforce, financial capital availability, uh, you, know, you know, either visits in the home or some kind of physical location um, in a market. Health insurance, of course, is a, is a major, you know, bubble to get over on, on the healthcare entrepreneurship. So those are kind of some of the policy implications for you uh, who are working in extension or leaders in rural communities that you could think about. Um, definitely growing the social capital is also something that communities can do, okay? 
Uh, when there's a new provider in town, reach out to them, help them find childcare, uh, coordinate uh, meetings with people with similar interests. And I'll just give a few anecdotal examples. When I, when I moved to Mizzou from Washington, DC, I thought, oh my gosh, where am I gonna find childcare? I had been on the wait list for daycare in DC for years, you know. Luckily, the situation in Missouri is not as bad, but it did take uh, a colleague making a phone call to get my two year old son into a daycare. So, helping new people um, hit the ground running, helping them get into a daycare, helping them connect with others with similar hobbies or similar stages of life, uh, particularly if they're bringing a family to the community, um, helping providers set up that support system within the community. These are all very low cost things that communities can decide to do to, um, to help provider retention, um, you know, kind of along the lines of social capital, particularly providers who don't already have a familial tie to the region. Um, you know, if you have a tie to the region, you maybe have a support system and maybe that's why someone's moving back. Uh, we see that a lot in the rural migration literature. Um, but for someone who doesn't have a support system, um, you know, we have a lot of healthcare providers in this country that are immigrants that are, are not from this country and they really do need a, a support system. And then the last policy implication here is a little bit more probably for the healthcare administrators, the people who responded to the key informant um, interviews. But, you know, talking to providers, helping them avoid burnout, um, helping them avoid wanting to look elsewhere. Um, by creating opportunities for work-life balance, reducing stress, uh, and increasing morale. Um, so in closing, um, you know, this was a nice paper. What was unique about this paper is that we had this quantitative data. So it's really one of the only studies that looks at this research question on healthcare um, provider retention in rural areas quantitatively as opposed to qualitatively. Um, and again, it had interesting findings related to community capitals, um, really that the job matters most and the individual factors matter a lot. Um, but, but otherwise, uh, at that point, then the, the community capitals, the community assets um, can come in. Um, I mentioned a few shortcomings. You know, I don't think the endogeneity is a big issue. Um, I, I do think that some of the reason these community capital variables were insignificant was that we didn't have a lot of different counties. So it would be great to, to do this, uh, if this survey was ever done again, to do it kind of more broadly geographically. So we got more variation in those community capitals. Um, but I think that there's a lot, I think there's a lot of talk right now about workforce. We're having kind of a workforce crisis all the time and healthcare workforce, particularly in crisis right now. Uh, so it's it was a, it was fun to work on this paper during COVID and, and feel like we were trying to help communities out, make a little bit of a difference. Um, we did come out with a MU extension guide that kind of summarizes this research. There's a few paragraphs on the healthcare entrepreneurship. Um, we look at some summary statistics for Missouri healthcare availability, particularly from the workforce lens. Um, so maybe not as relevant to those of you outside Missouri, but you might want to take a look and see if you want to duplicate the same thing for your state. Um, that's the beauty of extension. Uh, we can we can share those kinds of uh, resources together. So that's all I have. Questions, comments. Sarah, I'll try to monitor the chat. People can feel free to unmute themselves and uh, um, ask questions. I did, I wanna take one moment and recognize uh, Pat Bebo, who's here, who's on our advisory committee. And so thank you, Pat, for uh, joining us. And I wanna recognize Neil Flora as well, who's a former NCR CRD director. And uh, it's an honor to have you with us uh, here today, uh, Neil. So thanks so much for uh, attending. We have a great group of individuals that are here today. Thank you all for attending. Um, if you have questions for Sarah, feel free to uh, put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and uh, pepper away. I'm honored that Neil is here. I hope I represented her book well. <laughs> questions, comments? I have a question, um, Sarah. Uh, hi, Adrian. Hi. Um, I had a question about uh, telehealth since Mizzou has a big sort of telehealth education outreach to providers. If you 
had looked at that at all and was able to add it into the survey. I know that a lot of our providers find it, rural providers find it to be a nice um, connection to the profession still to have that prof professional relationship. Yeah, we, um, you know, this survey instrument, because of the federal cycle, let's just say it's, you've been in the federal, it's not very easy to do a federal survey. Let's just put it that way. There's a little thing called SIPSI. So I would say this survey instrument was developed about a decade ago before really telehealth was what it was today. But Adrian, maybe you could share with us, particularly since COVID, like I had my first telehealth visit during COVID. Um, what do you think about telehealth as an option for rural healthcare provider retention and, and um, attraction? Yeah, so I, the distinction that I like to make is sort of, there's the, there's the telemedicine, which is the consumer facing side of it, which is nice to reach more of the patients. And then a lot of what Mizzou does is actually outreach to providers. So, you know, primary care providers or more general providers can get some amount of specialty training, even though they don't. And that's what I think of as telehealth education um, and not necessarily medicine where you're like, um, prescribing stuff or seeing patients. Cool. Great. Um, so, it, so it could help retention in that you can get your continuing education, maybe a little bit of networking with other colleagues. Great. Right. Right. And so I think Mizzou has been strong in that. And I think that is a useful area for um, rural, for rural development anyway. The, the telemedicine side, there seems to be a lot of um, people prefer in-person visits um, still. But there's, there was a growing <laughs> curve during the pandemic, but it seems that there's still a preference for in-person conversations with doctors. Great. Thanks, Adrian. Adrian knows a lot more about rural health <laughs> than, than I do. I appreciate that. Other questions or comments? Does this stuff resonate? I see I see a lot of you guys are, are rural development people as opposed to health people. Does this resonate with those of you in rural development? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, first, yes, it does resonate. I'm calling or coming from Wyoming, so it's pretty much all rural here. Uh, so we specialize in. <laughs> but on your last point on replicating this in other places uh, through other extension programs, do you think that your results are um, representative of the rest of the United States, or do you think that would be interesting to compare states? Or what do you? What was your impression? Yeah. No, great question, Anders. Um, if you'll remember, this survey was just three regions, right? Upper Midwest, uh, Lower Mississippi Delta, and then the Great Plains region. And I didn't get into it in this paper, but there, it's like a whole nother paper. There were huge regional differences to get to your point, Anders. Huge regional differences. Uh, I'm from Iowa. So I'll say the upper Midwest was very upper Midwest. You know, we're educated, we like things, we're you know, high response rate, it's utopia, you know. No. <laughs> but really it was it was fascinating. The upper Midwest, <laughs> everyone like people like the utopia kind of the the it was a very different situation for providers in the upper Midwest. And then the lower Mississippi Delta was like, you know, as a 180. It was a, again, a very different situation, a, a more severe situation. Um, so, and, and then the Great Plains was kind of kind of in the middle in that situation, Anders. So, I think I think there's likely to be tremendous regional variation in these particular results. Um, like I said, we just have these three regions. Uh, the, the results do hold for all three regions. Okay, I wouldn't have presented, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have pooled them if the results didn't hold for all these three regions. But it would be cool to be able to do this more nationally. And and a lot of us on here are regional economists or regional scientists. It would be great to look at the spatial variation of this sort of thing and kind of identify different policies for different regions. So like for Anders in Wyoming, I can see, you know, in the Intermountain West, um, the, the telemedicine, the, the professional development that Adrian was talking about for practitioners. 
being, you know, a lot more important than, you know, in Ohio, you know, where Pat is, where, you know, people are a little more densely populated. So, yeah, I do think there's, I think, I do think there's regional variation. Um, that's, that's my, that's my answer. So I was going to, yeah, uh, I was going to jump in and say, and uh, I invited our, uh, we have a <clears throat> joint hire with College of Pharmacy. So Miriam on the call here is a pharmacist. And in Ohio, she, we were conver conversing. I said, why wasn't, isn't a pharmacist part of the health, isn't a healthcare provider? Mm -hmm. And she says, it's not recognized everywhere. Mm -hmm. And in Ohio, it is recognized in law. So you could also have differences in how policy defines your healthcare providers. Wow, cool. That's awesome. You Thanks think of too, the entrepreneurial pharmacist yeah. as a very solid cornerstone of a community. Yeah, yeah. Particularly, you know, uh, particularly you see the. This is just me anecdotally, but the proliferation of CVS and Walgreens, whereas not that long ago it was a lot of independently owned, you know, family owned pharmacies. Uh, I, I have a couple friends here in uh, Columbia, Missouri, that are pharmacists and talk about, you know, the retail pharmacy thing. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tough, it seems, um, particularly if you're at a, at a Walmart or, a, you know, a, a Walgreens or something. Miriam, did you have anything to add? Well, I unmuted myself in anticipation. So first of all, thanks for that presentation. That was wonderful. Um, I kept nodding my head here. You didn't see me, of course, because my video was off. And I was like, yep, I resonate with everything you're saying. You know, unfortunately, here in Ohio, we have healthcare deserts, even though we may be more populated than other parts of the country, because our independent pharmacy shut down and your CVS, Walgreens, Walmart didn't come by and fill those spaces. And a lot of times they bought out those pharmacies. So we're looking at healthcare deserts, especially, I'm gonna use Pat's background. The J part of the, of the state there is our Appalachian counties and they're suffering the most because they don't see as much healthcare period. And sometimes it's the pharmacist is the only person available to them. And like you said, there's burnout in the rural areas. And not only that, all my pharmacists are giving shots right now, giving tons of COVID vaccines and boosters and flu shots. And so along with the personnel shortage, they also actually have a doubled workload that's influencing their, their want to serve their community, even though that's why they chose those locations in the first place. Fascinating. I hadn't thought about the giving, giving vaccinations piece too. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate that. Again, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Yeah, definitely. Other questions, comments? Sarah, I'm reminded that uh, Steve Deller in the CreeNet uh, email chat thing, if you will, brought up pharmacies a few weeks ago and people lamenting the loss of pharmacies on Main Street and the loss of independent pharmacies. And I, I threw a wrinkle in that discussion asking about veterinarians and animal health and the loss of them. And at least here in Indiana, we're struggling to fill vacancies and veterinary practices are going out of business in rural areas because they can't find successors. And so I wonder if there's interest in the community to look at perhaps pharmacies, but also maybe even look from a rural development standpoint that uh, animal ag and veterinary uh, piece of it as well. And maybe there's already been some work out there, but I wanted to throw it out and see if you knew of anything. Yeah, definitely. Um, Mark White's on this call. Uh, I don't know if I can call him out, but he's done some work. He's visited with um, folks about the veterinarian shortage in, in rural areas. He's kind of a, a workforce specialist. Mark, do you have any thoughts on the veterinarian piece that Michael mentioned? Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, I guess that, you know, the question is, is there a veterinarian shortage? And the answer is it kind of depends uh, a little bit on where you're located. And, um, you know, in, in, in rural areas, it's a lot of the practices tend to be, you know, mixed mixed animal practices. So some are, you know, uh, large animal vets and I mean, large animal vets and then, you know, dogs and cats and things of that sort. Um, and, the, you know, the challenge they have in getting, you know, in, in a lot of these kind of more rural communities where there may be a demand is like getting someone to move there because it's a typical problem of getting someone with a skilled kind of a, you know, a, a person with a lot of education to move to a, a rural particular or a rural place because, um, you know, maybe there's not a job for their spouse and maybe there's not a, you know, um, you know, or if they don't have a spouse, there's not a job or an opportunity to find a spouse. 
Um, so there's like life considerations that come in in terms of getting people to move to you know, rural areas. And here in Mizzou, when I talk to our kind of our vet school here, I mean, there is a, a program that the state has that'll pay for you know, some of the vet school bills for, for people like a half dozen or, or more uh, vets to move to rural places or in needed spots in the, in the um, kind of in, in the state. Um, but, you know, again, you got to find people who want to, to do that. Um, you know, on the, you know, in, in more urban areas, or suburban areas, I think it's a little bit less of a kind of less of an, of an issue. Um, you know, in terms of the kind of just the kind of the the health angle of it or the telehealth angle, I mean, that's something that a lot of people are actually uh, kind of working on um, as well, because, you know, if you're a vet in a rural place, there's a lot of windshield time driving to and from places. So if you can find a place to, or a way to kind of reach people in a more efficient way, that's better. So whether that's at a, you know, a farm and fleet or an Orchland having some kind of uh, kiosk where you can connect with a vet, that's something that people have thought about. Or uh, there's also places where uh, like farmers can bring their animals, uh, for instance, to uh, a facility where, um, you know, the vet can work uh, on the animal and, um, you know, rather than the vet going to the farm, the farmer comes to the vet, um, but having, you know, it's appropriately, you know, equipped and it's out of the weather and conditions and, and they can see that many more kind of, um, you know, animals in a, in, a, in a period of time. So, I mean, they're all, it's, you know, is there a vet shortage? The answer is it kind of depends um, where you are. Uh, in some places, I think it's probably particularly acute. In other places, it's um, it's it's not. And some of the you know the challenges of why people stay or don't stay often tend to be personal. But there's also issues of you know the big skill that a lot of vets are lacking are on the business side of things because it's kind of like being a doctor or a dentist or whatever. You're trained to be kind of a specialist. You're not trained to run a small business, but that's what a lot of them have to do. And so. You know, having support networks for for vets, whether it's kind of people at the local bank or whatever, to to help out our, our kind of issues. So I don't know if that you know answers the questions, but I think there's a lot of you know a lot of kind of similar challenges between the veterinary side and and the and just kind of just the general healthcare side. I think there's a lot of overlap and similarities. Let me raise a question too with Miriam here in pharmacy. Uh, you know, and, and maybe Adrian wants to jump in too. Does the uh, does the internet also create competition? Here's my anecdote. Uh, I have an epileptic dog. So I go to the MU vet school pharmacy very often <laughs> for controlled substances. And they're always so nice. And I got to talk to them last time. They said, we really appreciate your business. We're glad you don't go online. And apparently this is kind of an issue for the university pharmacy is that they're losing all this business to Chewy and walmart.com. And this is an urban area. And so it kind of made me think, oh, it's kind of interesting, you know, that if you do want to be a pharmacist in a rural area or you hang out your shingle and want to be an entrepreneurial pharmacist, you know, could you be facing a lot of competition from Walmart's, Walmart's online pharmacy or, or Chewy.com for for dog prescriptions that can also be filled at human pharmacies. So I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. Adrian, you just turned your camera on. Do you have a, a competition? Yeah, so um, this is also anecdotally from sitting in on the faculty meetings with pediatricians, but it, it does seem like there's some, at least in their um, practice, there's some concerns about what an insurance provide where you need to be for an insurance provider to cover your visit. I think some of the mental health stuff has been because mental health was sort of the first uh, telemedicine and it's much more established. It's more clear what insurance will and will not cover, but some of the other practices, um, the insurers don't cover as much. And so that obviously consumers and um, patients are not always aware about what insurance will and will not cover. Um, and there's a huge learning curve with that. And I think even insurance, the insurance market still needs to figure out how to deal with that, those jurisdictional boundaries. Um, the, the, the other point that Mark made me think of, and this is because my brother-in-law is a dentist, is that there are also this is in terms of like entrepreneurship opportunities. There are like some restrictions on who can own like a dentist business. Like only dentists can own 
dentist business. And so you can't really get like a CVS type of dentistry practice because of the legal restrictions around um, the business licenses. And so I find that really interesting as well in terms of rural development. Definitely. To, to echo Adrian's point on insurances, that's the issue we're facing with our, like you call them, your online pharmacies. We call them mail order in our world. Um, unfortunately, you know, it also depends on what insurance you have. So certain insurances will say, we will ask you to pay a lower copay if you get your medications through the mail. And here's the problem with that. If I'm a pharmacist, which I am, and my patient walks in and has an antibiotic, I'll hold the bottle and say, before I give this to you, remember to take each of them, finish it off, even though you're feeling better and have it with food. If you get that in the mail, you know, when you get your packages, you don't look up the, the paper inserts, you toss everything, but whatever it is the price possession that you just ordered. Um, so I'm losing out on that, on that counseling portion. Here's where it matters for rural health. What if I'm a diabetes patient and I have insulin and this truck has to drive from Columbus, Ohio, where I live up to Mount Vernon, which is an hour North or even further, even maybe more rural. Can I guarantee that the refrigeration was consistent throughout that journey? And if so, how would I know that? There's no thermometer that comes with my insulin. If I'm an elderly patient, can I tell, am I savvy enough to go online and say, I have enough insulin vials or insulin pens for the month. Can you not, can you hold my next fill? So I've had elderly patients come to me with boxes, literally of insulin saying, I don't need these, can you take them? Well, by law, I can't, so now that's wasted product. So the state is now spending money, if it's a Medicaid patient, the state is spending money on insulin that isn't being used. And that is actually worthless because maybe the refrigeration wasn't good for the, for the trip. Loads of issues with mail order. Yes, I agree with your pharmacist, Sarah. Thanks if I may want to, yeah, yeah ahead, it's a great it's a great conversation and I don't want to halt the conversation, but I want to be a, a cognizant aware of, of uh, everyone's time. Is there a, a, a last question, a burning question that someone would like to ask? I did have to laugh. Um, all the sociologists on the call, I'm sure, made a bet as to whether any of the applied economists were going to answer with, it depends. And Mark wound up answering, it depends. And so all the sociologists on the call have been paying each other via Venmo after that occurred a few minutes ago. So I'm glad, Mark, that you were able to, uh, you know, benefit some of the folks on the call, but perhaps not everyone, depending yeah, on- Yeah, well, in fairness, I'm, I'm kind of an economic geographer by training, which is kind of like <laughs> economics, but without the rigor. So, um, I can well, skew both ways, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you so very, very much. We really appreciate um, uh, everyone joining us today. There is a, uh, a webinar next month, and I do not have the information, embarrassingly, for me in front of me. Shelly, do you happen to have, or Saad or Maria, do you have that information in front of you? Well, we do have a webinar next month, I promise you, and, and it'll be in our newsletter, was in our newsletter, and uh, you'll be getting email blasts out to uh, to join um, our webinar next month. Uh, November so thank 3rd. You. <laughs> Sorry, so, November 10th. <laughs> November 10th. Yes. Three to four, Latino farmers in the Midwest practices and challenges. Awesome. I see the director com comes in. Thank you so, so very much, Marie. I should have had that in front of me, but I was having so much fun listening to to Sarah and Mark and everyone else. Appreciate the questions. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a wonderful job. It's great yeah. seeing you as always. Thanks for coming, everyone. Appreciate it. Have a good day, evening. Take care. Take care.